Welcome to Dynasty Life. I'm Theo Greminger. Redraft ends, but Dynasty is life. And a couple weeks back, I had Jeff Bell on. Uh, Jeff Bell is, of course, from Football Guys. And today I have another member of Football Guys on, Kevin Coleman. I'm really excited. This is the first time Kevin and I have had an opportunity to podcast together. Uh, and welcome back. Welcome to the show, Kev. We got a lot to talk about. This has been like a data dump for anybody uh, covering anything Dynasty related. We had like sort of like a lull where we were trying to dive into the rookie class. Then we get the combine. Then we get this huge free agency dump. Now we're kind of back into collecting information, maybe looking at some top 30 visits, trying to project the NFL draft. And then we're going to have a whole nother data dump again in, in, a, in about a month when we have the NFL draft. Yeah, I mean, it's a lot of fun. It's, it's so funny how like you get the ebbs and flows of the Dynasty stuff and like how it comes and you get all this information on there. Um, I love the tier stuff. I know we're going to be talking about that kind of like going through. All right, how do I move places? I love trading. As you do, I see your tweets all the time and you're trading and going through there. So like finding where, because I think that's where the value is at right now. It's trying to find where you can move and maneuver. How can you pair up your late rounds or your early seconds, get into that first um, tier? You know, are people still sleeping on the tiers? Are your dynasty managers out there still sleeping? It's March, but some of those members have not checked their phone for three months. They have not logged into Sleeper yet. So like, how can you extract some value there? Um, and then I also promise not to talk as much as Jeff Bell. So I definitely won't do that. Shout out to Jeff. Jeff, you did a great job if you listen to this one. And yeah, it's it's funny. You get the the high like the dynasty managers who hibernate, maybe yeah. dynasty managers who check out it's March Madness. I want to watch a little college basketball. Uh, but then you get that week where it's sort of peak dynasty, where yeah. we go from the NFL draft to our rookie drafts, and it's so quick. Uh <laughs> so it's we we love it. My friend Alan Soslowski, my co-host of, of Sonic Truth, calls it a snow globe league where you know, we keep getting all this information and sort of dumps on it once. Mm -hmm. uh, and and we, we love it. I think that's one of the keys for Dynasty is sort of being able to kind of roll with the punches and adjust takes when needed, but not be too reactionary uh, when we see certainly a talented player. And, you know, Kevin, uh, why don't you let everybody know a couple of things you're dropping over at Football Guys? What's sort of like your March and early April looking like? Yeah, you know, really just heavy diving into the rookie stuff. We do the rookie guide over at Football Guys, me, Jeff Bell, and Christian Williams. Um, so we just dropped our version 2.0. We're working on 3.0 now. After the draft, we just drop like every 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 relevant player you know and where they're at and and what we expect from them in our in our drafts, where you should draft them. So that's something we're working on. We do the Dynasty Football Show as well, um, and that's weekly. And we just kind of talk about different players. Right now, we're doing deep dives, so we, we're just going through every single position now of the rookie class and kind of giving values and narratives and like oh my gosh is JJ McCarthy really going to go number two overall and we kind of just dive into all of that um and, and it's just been a lot of fun in terms of I love that part of the rookie talk and doing stuff like this and stuff the writing part is where I, it hurts me because I, I do I also do dynasty pieces I just dropped one today about the riskiest quarterbacks um out there in dynasty and kind of what you should be doing with them over at football guys who is the riskiest quarterback in fantasy in dynasty right now Kevin honestly I think it's speech. Justin Herbert Okay. Is it because of the stylistic changes in Los Angeles or sort of could he be at his dynasty peak with a couple of these young guys really kind of stepping up ahead of him in the dynasty values? Yeah, you know, I went through five um, of the Dynasty QEPs where I was like kind of worried. But just when I got to Herbert, you know, I'm a Michigan fan, so I know Harbaugh. I know all about his stylistic system. I know him and Roman, like, you know, when looking at passing attempts when they had Kaepernick and Alex Smith were down probably 31st, 32nd. Um, I'm worried about that. So I'm really worried about kind of what that stylistic looks like. And just like, you know, the weapons overall, right? They do, Josh Palmer is the best weapon. I like Josh Palmer. I'm a, I'm a little closet Josh Palmer stand. Like, I like, I think he has value. I thought he had value last year. But, like, what are they going to do with that fifth pick? I think that's going to tell the story of Justin Herbert. Will they go get a wide receiver like Malik Neighbors and Marvin Harrison Jr.? Or are they going to go offensive line or trade back and maybe go after Dunze and one of those guys? Um, but I just look at it, like, tier-based. You know, you're sitting there with, like, you know, Justin Herbert at QB 7, 8 in some ranges. Then you have Kyler Murray at, like, 11, 12. Man, if I could tear down to Kyler, get that upside, maybe they add Marvin Harrison Jr. and get another piece. Like to me, I'm like, man, Justin Herbert scares me a little bit. He's he, he's just one of those guys that I think he can go a lot of different ways, a lot of variables, and I think his floor got a little lower, and that concerns me a little bit. Just keep calm and add Gus Edwards to your dynasty <laughs> rosters, everyone. That's going to be this year's ugly Jamal Williams, Raheem Mostert, veteran who falls in the end zone a bunch of times in a out of out of not really out of nowhere. But he goes Harbaugh to Harbaugh. 
landed pretty well. I think like you look at that Chargers roster, not a whole lot of guys I want on my dynasty roster right now. I completely agree with you on Herbert. We actually talked about that on the Sonic Truth Dynasty pod, uh, podcast. You can check that out uh, from earlier this week. Um, but Herbert versus like Caleb Williams, I, I'm Caleb all day right yeah. now. Um, and we're talking about a, a guy, Justin Herbert, who's relatively young and he's given us a QB2 finish. It just goes to show you how situations can change and kind of influence fantasy production despite the immense talent that Justin Herbert's displayed. But it's your first time in the chair here, Kevin. And despite being in technically the spring now, uh, we got to go back with a little bit of these evergreen questions that I ask pretty much every guest the first time they get to Dynasty Life. You guys put a ton of work into your Dynasty content over at Football Guys, extensive work, but we don't always get things correct. A lot of times we can have misses. And in redraft, a miss really only hurts you for one season. But for Dynasty, those kind of sort of misses can amplify themselves and, and really kind of tank you for a couple of years mm -hmm. when it comes to you know rookie drafts or, or a startup strategy. Who was a player that was a huge disappointment for you in Dynasty in 2023? Bryce Young. Uh, I think, you know, just from... I just, I always felt like, cause I was a big Bryce guy when he was a freshman, you know, we were talking pre-show about like Debbie and I do a lot of college football stuff. And so I've loved Bryce Young. He's from California. I got a little soft spot for my guys from California. And I just thought he could overcome, you know, the lack of weapons. I thought Chark and I thought, Hey, Thielen's there, Sanders, all these guys. And like, he would be cerebral enough. And I, and I, and it's it's so funny though because I kick myself as a dynasty manager and even an analyst. I hated Frank Reich with the Colts, and then I bought into it with the pan. And I was like, and I and I was thinking this afterwards. I was like, what was I doing? Like, if I hated him with the Colts, why did I buy into it? It's so funny how that works. Sometimes you just you trick yourself and like, no, it's gonna be better here. Um, and I just thought that he was gonna be over to, over able to overcome that, you know. And I think in Superflex Dynasty rookie drafts, I mean, he's going 101, 102. I definitely picked Bryce over CJ Stroud in the league. I know that happened, and I'm kicking, you know, it's one of those things where you kick yourself a little bit. Um, but completing less than 60% of his passes, only 11 touchdowns, 10 interceptions. I mean, he looked bad. I mean, he averaged only 10 and a half fantasy points per game. Like, that is just absolutely, you know, terrible. I do think. There's upside there because I'm always an optimist with Bryce Young. So I do love what his position is. Dave Canales and those guys coming there. But I mean, he's a disappointment through and through because of what you missed if you took him. Even Richardson, even like, you know, Stroud, these guys that are going, Bijan, these other guys that kind of there. Like Young, I think, would go in the back end of the first round now. And I think that's a huge value miss. Yeah, I think I think that you nailed it. And certainly there's a chance for a rebound. But at the end of the day, it's going to be virtually impossible for him short of an injury to catch Anthony Richardson and CJ Stroud and Dynasty and those other positional players all really, really hit sort of amplified his fail failures this season. Uh, how about a, a, a positive surprise, a player who maybe you were bullish on him, but really exceeded expectations this year. And we're not allowing Puka Nakua as this <laughs> response from anyone, Kevin, because it's too easy. That's yeah, too easy. I know. Uh, I, you know, for me, when I, you know, I was thinking about this question, it's funny. I actually had to get this guy added by sleeper last year during my rookie mocks because he wasn't in the database yet. And like, because I wanted to draft him and it was Sam Laporta. Um, I was like, I actually DM sleeper. I was like, Hey, can you add this guy? I, I was like, I do these rookie drafts. I like to draft him there. And he was going in the fourth round before the draft. He was going in the fourth round of rookie drafts. And when you look at what he did, I mean, 86 passes, 889 yards, 10 touchdowns. I mean, overall tight end one dynasty tight end one now for some, um, I just think for me, I didn't expect that right away. Right. Like I, and it maybe was a perfect, you know, catechism of where he landed. Real, well, Jamison Williams got suspended those first, you know, games of the season because of the, the gambling. And he just kind of came into a great situation with a great offensive coordinator. Um, but man, I mean, when you look at him and what he was able to put out there, he's only 22. Like that to me was the biggest surprise because it kind of reshaped the tight end market and it's reshaped the tight end market a little bit for this year. Like, cause everybody just assumed Brock Bowers was coming in. Oh, Brock Bowers. We've been hearing about him for years. He's going to be a top four guy. And now you have all these great young tight ends like Laporta who popped off and now it's like, Oh, maybe Brock Bowers is kind of a value now in rookie drafts. Maybe like we can actually get him a little later. Um, so I think the Laporta, you know, breakout was a revelation for the tight end position. I think for me, that's like a surprise that he popped off so hard and it's hard because Iowa is a terrible offense, like in, in college. So it's hard to like expect this from Iowa tight ends, um, but they do produce them, but it's like, where's that production come from? And he kind of broke that mold, that first year tight end like curse. And he broke that right through the door. 
I think, you know, it's a couple things you mentioned there where you talk about the tight end revolution. That's certainly the youth at the position where we're seeing a changing of the guards of the sort of the, the, the Laportas, the McBrides, the Kincaids, the Bowers in the rankings over the, the Kelsey's the the Kittles that have sort of been there for a while and are now North of 30. But one other thing I think that Laporta did, and I'm, I wonder your opinion on this is there were some people last year who I really respect in the dynasty minds that talked about Laporta, a red flag for him being his size and certainly his height and his weight where we're so used to seeing over the years, the Rob Gronkowski's, the Jimmy Graham's, the truly, Mm -hmm. you know, beast mode type tight ends that are like defensive ends or basketball players. Mm -hmm. And then now we sort of have this archetype with the Laportas, the McBrides, the Kincaids, Bowers, and we'll throw Evan Ingram in there. Those 6'3", 6'4", 240 pound tight ends. I had a tight end uh, only show a few days ago with Dan Williamson here on Dynasty Life where we talked about sort of the the mismatch tight end. Those Mm -hmm. guys are kind of in vogue right now. Do you think that this is a, a sign of things to come? Or do you think it just happens to be a sample size of players and a couple of years from now we'll get another six, seven guy who breaks fantasy? You know, it's it's funny that you ask because we, we go back and forth in this all the time in our forums for football guys with all the old guys, the OGs, they call themselves because they've seen fantasy for like years. You just ask them. Sigmund Bloom's been around forever. And they always talk about kind of the shifts of like offenses and how the rules affect that, too. So I think a part of it with the tight ends is like we've seen more open concepts like from college football you've seen these kind of you know the spread forms and then the you know, air raid and all of that and so no longer do you need that three down traditional inline tight end now you can spread them out now they're going to use them in different ways so and really what i think is fascinating and i think everybody at managers got to look at this is just follow the shanahan coaching tree because those tight those that system wherever you're at they really utilize the tight end and they use a lot of them in a lot of fun ways and even Ben Johnson now once you go somewhere and you're looking at that coaching tree so as those coaching trees kind of expand themselves you're going to see the you're going to see them target these type of tight ends now will there ever be a flow back i don't know i mean we just had the rule change the hip drop tackle it got whatever and now people are talking about it way smarter people than me about how like it's gonna you know maybe the increase the bigger tight ends now are gonna get you know a little bit more run because it can be hard to bring them down now how much do i think that's gonna take effect i don't know that's the fun part about this i'm sure it'll flip back i made a joke yesterday it's time to buy darnell washington um because hey if anybody's gonna do it it's that big boy um but you might see kind of like the flip there based on rules and everything but it just made it easier i think scheme is the biggest thing i think follow the scheme as schemes have opened up and tight ends have done that. And I will say, like, you see more teams use two tight ends. They'll just draft an inline tight end. They're like, hey, we'll just draft an inline tight end in the block, but we'll use a guy like Kincaid or these guys as like a wide receiver now. So that's essentially what you're seeing. And it's interesting to see how the rules affect that if it's going to come back a little bit. It'll probably swing back a little bit. But I do think that those smaller tight ends are something the league's going to keep. Yeah, definitely an interesting thing to monitor this year, especially with Brock Bowers uh, potentially changing the position a little yeah. bit more. Uh, one other question I like to ask people, and this is, was something that uh, I used to ask for redraft, but now I'm asking it earlier and earlier since we're basically drafting all year with startups and best balls and you name it. If you could know the final stats, the final 2024 stats of any player in football, whether it's a rookie, whether it's a veteran, who would it be? Yeah, this is a tough one. Um, and, and just in the constant, like, uh, you know, what we're talking about and what we're doing here in terms of rookies, I, I stick, I stuck with rookies. I want to know JJ McCarthy's 2024 final stats, because I think that he's going to go down as one of the guys that's either the, ba- the biggest value in super flex drafts going like 111, 110 in some drafts. I, I did a real rookie draft in one of my leagues that drafts before he went 111 last week. So he could either be the biggest value in Superflex because he becomes like a top two pick and he really pushes itself there. Or you're looking at it you're like, wait, he only got one game this year. What happened? Or you see the Bryce numbers and he becomes the fall on your face prospect that everybody kind of is kind of leaning towards. So for me, I think it's JJ just because that is the probably the most argued about person on social media. I don't know. I'm not on it as much as I used to be, uh, but I see a lot, a lot of sides in the JJ McCarthy train. I just want to know who's right right now. Tell me who is right so I can kind of dictate that and know the answer there. Well, I'll say your league mate who got JJ McCarthy at the 111 a steal these days because he is moving up in the dynasty startups. Yeah. And uh, I think one we're going to talk about tiers, but I think like the 108 that's sort of going to be the floor if he gets this sort of draft capital we're going to talk about jj mccarthy we're also going to talk about 
a number of these other 2024 rookies. And then Kevin and I are going to kind of share how we can use tiers to really uh, have incredibly successful rookie drafts. We'll be right back. Hey, you know, people always ask me, what's the World Series of Fantasy? What's the Super Bowl of Fantasy? And it's easy. It's the FFPC. Their signature Players Championship has a $6 million prize pool. And their best ball leagues start in February. And they're the answer to so many questions. Hey, what's the best place to get a Dynasty Orphan? Well, you can adopt a Dynasty Orphan at the FFPC right now. There's more orphans at the FFPC than anywhere else on the internet. That's why we partner with them. So if you want to play fantasy football for low, medium, high stakes, you love Dynasty, you love best ball, you love seasonal leagues, all types of fantasy footballers need to go to the FFPC and remember... Use promo code UNDERWORLD. Promo code UNDERWORLD gets you $25 off your first team. Promo code UNDERWORLD, $25 off your first team, no matter what the format is, at the FFPC. Go get it. Welcome back to Dynasty Life. I'm Theo Greminger, joined by Kevin Coleman of Football Guys. And let's stick with J.J. McCarthy. This is a player that... At first, we had the resistance where Bo Nix, Michael Penix, J.J. McCarthy. You mentioned uh, Michigan. Michigan wins the national title. J.J. McCarthy declares for the draft. Jim Harbaugh calls him the greatest Michigan quarterback of all time. And we're like, yo, Jim, why didn't you pass a little more if you had the greatest quarterback of all time? But that being said, the hive starts buzzing a little bit. Then we see Michael Penix and Bo Nix both have sort of ordinary – Senior Bulls, didn't really grab the bull by the horns. Some Spencer Rattler talk. So J.J. McCarthy solidifies himself in the top four. Then you get a couple of people like my friend Brett Whitefield of, of, of Fantasy Points who say, you know, this is the best quarterback in the draft. And you say, whoa, whoa, chill out. Then as that the, we get through the process, you're getting more and more people coming and saying, you know, how J.J. McCarthy, this is my guy. There's a lot of people that we respect that are kind of on that train, Kevin. For me, I, I've become more and more open to J.J. I think J.J. is my 108 in Superflex right now, mm-hmm. and he's my quarterback four, but I still want to have some J.J. McCarthy on my fantasy teams. Do you start believing the J.J. McCarthy is really in consideration for Washington at two overall, or do you tend to think that this is a little bit of a smoke screen? Uh, so, you know, having watched JJ as a Michigan fan, um, for a long time, uh, I think that when you're looking, if you're the commanders, you're sitting there at one Oh two, like, you know, I was talking about this, you know, I, I think Drake may has to be the pick, you know, I, I think for me, when you look at that, because I think that system really placates him better. So like when I'm looking at Kingsbury system and what he's trying to do, um, you know, Drake may had 90% of his snaps are in shotgun. That's what Kingsbury is going to do there. Um, I like the weapons around them. I think he can, now I think Drake makes versatile. I think he can go in any system. So I'm not worried about that. Whereas like when you're thinking of like Jaden and JJ, like Jaden Daniels and JJ, they need like, they need a very tailor-made system for them. Right. And it's going to have to really highlight their strengths where JJ strength in is for me when I'm watching it and going to the film, it has to be some type of like McVeigh tree scheme in terms of like that West coast, kind of like a Jared Goff, like build around him, limit his inconsistencies. Cause I do think his weakness is like, he's a very one speed thrower. He's just gunning it. Right. They're going to have to develop that. You know, he is young, but he's just going to, he's gunning it no matter where he goes. He doesn't have a lot of touch on his throws. Um, and I do think that his deep balls he struggles with. So like in a Kingsbury offense, I don't know how much I would love for him to be in that kind of offense because I think that they want to push the ball down deep, and I don't think McCarthy has that. I think he at times he does. I just think he's inconsistent at times. I think with whoever drafts him, which I think my ideal landing spot is the Vikings, I think, in my opinion, for him. And everybody's going to say that, so it's not some hot take or you know something enlightening here on the pod. Uh, but I just feel like there's some – it has to go with Bucky Brooks and Danny Jeremiah for moving the sticks, talk about this all the time. Whoever drafts a guy like JJ needs to have a plan for them. Like not, oh, he fell. Let's get him. Oh, he's on our board. No. 
what is your plan? And really, they should be developing that plan right now. Hey, if JJ is here, how are we going to make him be- the most successful quarterback? And I think that sitting would help him, right? So, like for me, when I'm looking at him, I would love for him to sit for a little while, not as like the Jordan Love plan, but like the one year plan or like the half a year plan, just something to where he kind of develops in there. Um, I think Drake is more ready to go. Like, hey, we can throw him out there. He can kind of take his lumps there. JJ needs time. And I think that's one of those things. But I see the narratives, I see the QB1 stuff. And guys like that you mentioned, I respect a ton. I, I think that they watch film and they and they see it. Um, and I think JJ has that range of outcomes. But I also think JJ is he has a heck of a ceiling. He has a heck of a floor. And I think that scares me the most when you're looking at him as a prospect. I, I like I like what you, you referenced with the the floor and the ceiling. I also think that I agree with you that the ideal situation for JJ McCarthy would be him, you know, sitting behind like Gardner Minshew and, and, Mm -hmm. you know, entering, entering in, in like week 10. The problem is when you look at like the Lamar Jackson's and the Jalen hurts and the Jordan loves who were able to sit, whether it's for most of a season or for maybe basically their whole rookie season, those guys were drafted at the end of the first round or later with, when it comes to JJ McCarthy, the higher he's selected, the more pressure there's going to be to get him onto the, the field. So it's sort of like a, a double-edged sword where we want to mm-hmm. see him drafted really high. I love your Minnesota landing spot, but he's certainly an interesting one. And, you know, you have a, a real Debbie background, uh, Kev, and, and a lot of people haven't really dove into the 2025 class. But do you think that J.J. McCarthy, if he were to have returned to Michigan, he would be hands down the 101 quarterback in 2025 when you look at him in context with like Beck, and Ewers and Sanders and a couple of the other guys. And I would go ahead and say the 2025 class is not nearly what we're seeing here in 2024. Would you agree with those statements? He would undoubtedly be the one. And I don't think it's close. I think Beck is there, but I think that um, the 25 class is has so many question marks. I mean, looking at it, the value wise, I don't think a QB gets drafted. If you were just do like a 25 straight up to like 105, 106, to be honest with you. So like JJ would be the one coming in there. Um, and there is a huge tier break. So that's the other thing too. If you need a quarterback, this is the year you got to go grab these quarterbacks. Like if you, if you're thinking, Oh, neighbors is sitting there at one Oh three, I'll just wait until the second round and get Michael Pratt or Michael Penix or, or Bo Nix. That's I think wrong. In my opinion, like you, if you need a quarterback based on the 25 class that's coming, JJ, JJ should be your guy. Like you mentioned at one Oh eight, I'll smash that all day for JJ McCarthy, because I think the value is there. Hey, I'm okay with that one Oh eight. Um, and being there. And that's the other thing too, with these, the landing spots, you know, some of these teams didn't earn a first, you know, like a top five pick the Vikings and bears they They didn't earn those top five picks. They found themselves maybe possibly with the Vikings getting into the top five. Um, so those are the, those are the landing spots that reach out to me. Like, Oh yeah, I want them to go there. Like new England. That's gross, right? Like they earn that for a reason. They have a lack of talent. So a guy like JJ going there, that, that scares me a little bit more because he needs that. Inst- he needs that institution to be really built around him they don't have that ability yet because they just don't have the talent. So that's that's really where I get with these quarterbacks. Um, but yeah, JJ, QB1 next year. So that's what makes me lean. Teams know this. They're not dumb. So like makes me lean that he is going to get top 10 capital because they look at next year and be like, no, we got to go get him now. Interesting that you 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 know talked about the being down on that 2025 class. If for simply for dynasty managers, um, do you think that there is a, an argument that you should take some more shots on the Bo Nixes, the Michael Penixes, and maybe the Spencer Rattlers just because what's coming up around the bend is not necessarily going to be that appealing, uh, you know, for, for, for dynasty managers really looking to up to at least solidify depth uh, with some potential options at the QB spot. Yeah, I don't think it's all ever a bad thing to take some of those cute guys, right? Aiden O'Connell kind of came out of, you know, he he played a little bit in terms of his last year. He was like a late round pick. Clayton Toon tried. We we missed on that one. He did not, he did not look very good. Not but we, he got- not not we. Jack Fal- <laughs> Jack Falcone. Shout out to Scott Bollinger. He's the 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 Clayton Toon fan club club guy. Yeah. Not me. Not me. Jax. So so those guys out there, I mean, and, and it is worth the shot, right? Taking them there. I think you, to your point, yes. I would say though, that like, because there's so much unknown about the 25 class, some of those guys might pop off next year. And some of those guys will, I know the league loves Carson Beck from everything that you hear. Um, we have Cecil Laramie. Um, he does all stuff for the Broncos uh, at football guys. He talks about like, he said, Beck would probably be ahead of McCarthy based on some NFL guys. So the guys he's listening to. So I do think that there are some that could pop off, but I don't mind ever taking like shots on some 
some third or fourth round guys. Rattler, for example, if he went to like the Raiders, Michael Pratt from Tulane, I don't mind him. I, I know he's getting some first round um, like grades from teams kind of out there, according to Jim Nagy, like grabbing those guys rather than some of those wide receivers. Everybody thinks they're going to get the next Puka with their fourth round pick. It's probably not happening. Let's just be real. Like if you can grab those quarterbacks that get some type of value, especially rebuilding teams, go grab some of those quarterbacks that you can ship off for some assets later as you're rebuilding, as like teams lose their quarterbacks, like Joe Burrow and all these guys this last year. I think that's a really good strategy to implement in your leagues, especially in your rookie drafts. Yeah, and it's it, it super flex. The the equity of a starting quarterback is is there. I mean, it's a yeah. there's just so many of them. So taking shots on some of those guys, even guys like Desmond Ritter had a small window where they mm -hmm. they gained you a lot of value based on where you took them in the rookie drafts. It's a short window, but it was a window. <laughs> um, let's talk about these these landing spots because would you say that Minnesota and Chicago are two of the best landing spots that we've seen? For a young quarterback, we think about, you know, and, and when we talk about young quarterbacks with incredible draft capital, these highly selected quarterbacks sometimes fall into these bad situations where it takes them a year or so. A guy like Caleb Williams could come in and immediately put up, you know, pretty strong QB1 numbers. And you bring up Drake May. If Drake May were to land in Minnesota, I mean, I would love that 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 spot for him as well. How excited are you about these two landing spots? Yeah, I mean, so what I do, and for those of you out there, if you play, you know, Dynasty, one thing I've done in the last few years, because never get complacent in your in what you do. Like, if you miss guys, you know, learn from it. But I also strategy. I do a show with Leo Pasiga. He's he's at Football Guys now, but he's a big Dynasty. He's been in the game for a long time. He always talks about adapting and doing those things. What I do for each of these landing spots where I think these quarterbacks are going to go, I rate them as the offseason goes, and I and I basically weapon, staff, offensive line, defense. Okay, how do I like this? And then that's how I weigh whether I pick these guys in, in, in rookie drafts. If they're in the same tier for me, all right, you know, May and McCarthy, let's look at where they landed. Okay, this is how I have it ranked. I'm going to lean with my rankings based on the weapons that they have. So I did that with all these teams, and before the show, too, I, I, I was, I was kind of diving into it. You know, for the Bears, to me, you know, they are in the 109, not the 101. They're ready to go. And I love Shane Waldron being there. I know he gets some hate in terms of like, you know, his his offense and kind of how he, how he utilizes players, but he made Geno Smith relevant. And anybody that makes Geno Smith relevant, I'm in uh, because I am not a Geno Smith guy. And he got in that second contract and made him a fantasy asset, right? Like that's what we're talking about here. I love that development for him there. Um, weapons for the Bears, you know, I rate as an eight and I like that. Offensive line's incomplete yet. They still got to do some things for the offensive line. But I think the underrated thing is defense. You know, they have a ready to go defense. And I think that puts Caleb in some positive game scripts where he's not going to have to do too much. Like he could be more efficient, which he needs to be because at USC, he was putting a lot of negative game scripts and he was just running around back there. And you saw those games that he kind of got into. Imagine Caleb in a positive game scripts with all those weapons around him. That's a perfect spot. Like that is to me, like the, the key to all of that, the Vikings, I think the staff just is the 10, right? Like I gave him a 10 on their staff. Cause I think having that offensive coordinator isn't going to be important in terms of, you know, a head coach being an offensive coordinator. And that's the other thing that you should know, like, look at like, that's the thing with the commanders. You know, when you're looking at what they're doing, in new England, um, these guys, head coaches are defensive guys. So if their offensive coordinator d does hit, or even like Waldron a little bit, like if, if Waldron does well, Waldron might get a head coaching opportunity next year. And it kind of resets the clock on these rookie quarterbacks. Cause now they got to learn a new system and all that. So these are all things to take it like an account when you're looking at this. I think that's why the Vikings are the best spot. Yeah, I, I love the Viking spot. And you talk about offensive line play. Minnesota, we don't have anything to worry about. When that offensive line is healthy, that's yeah. very, very strong. So, uh, and even the Aaron Jones pickup, like mm -hmm. everything that Minnesota's done, um, I think it's setting themselves up for a, a quarterback to have success. Be very interesting to see. Let's pivot over to the running back position. True or false, do you agree with me that this running back class has become so beat up that it is underrated at this point? Oh yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. hundred percent. Like people are haters. I don't understand. Like you, th these guys all, and I've said it since January, all of these guys have a very good skill set in something and yeah. wherever they go, if they're utilized that way, they're going to have value. Like we have some very good pass catching backs in this class. We have some very good one, you know, first, second down guys in this bat in this class. Like, and if they go to a spot where they can be running back to on a depth chart right away, 
I'm in. Like, it doesn't really matter who it is. It just depends on what their volume is going to look like and a landing spot. But they are, this class is completely underrated right now because it's all, it, it flipped, right? Oh my gosh, it's the worst class ever. Well, no, there's value there. And, and these guys have skills and traits. A lot of these guys, they're a lot of fun to watch on tape too. A lot of it is, I, I think in Dynasty, there's a lot of people who get take lock. And when we get our initial, you know, kind of, initial analysis a lot of people start kind of diving into mm -hmm. it where we heard this is a bad running back class because there's no Brees Hall there's no Jameer Gibbs there's no Bijan Robinson and I would agree on that I don't think we have like that that pure star power at the top but we do have a lot of players who I think could be RB2 or better for multiple mm -hmm. seasons their NFL careers so I, I'm really excited about that um, and I think that we're going to have great value for us in our rookie in our rookie drafts and you know how it is Kev at the end of the NFL draft, like the the Monday after, there's going to be one or two running backs because of the landing spot people are like freaking out about, and those guys rise up in, in rookie drafts. Yeah. It happens all the time. But let's talk about one really exciting running back in this class, and and I know uh, this is a player that you're very high on, and I'll, I'll give a, a hat tip to Jeff Bell, your partner in crime over there at Football Guys. When he was uh, in this chair, we were pre-NFL Combine, and he was talking about Marshawn Lloyd. Marshawn Lloyd certainly has a huge NFL combine, uh, 220 plus runs in the four fours, big time speed score. Uh, you know, he's a guy who's gained a lot of steam, but Marshawn Lloyd also had the senior bowl where people were starting to get a little hyped about him. Jalen Wright was supposed to be in mobile, ends up getting a little banged up, makes his sort of big splash off season news at, at the combine at 210 pounds. He runs a four, three, eight, 40. A speed score of 114.1 and that 100 anything over 110 on a speed score is really really good and Jalen Wright also gave us a thousand yards in the SEC at Tennessee mm -hmm. could he be this year's Devon A chain a guy who just kind of ends up in a, the right system and gives us big spike weeks um weak winning potential type guy with a big play ability out of Tennessee yeah, I think he can. You know, he was my pre combine running back one in the guide. And re really, what I saw, because like we said with the running backs, there's so many different traits with these guys. It's hard to kind of pinpoint the guy, the running back one. The trait that I saw was explosiveness. And the one thing that translates pretty well to the NFL, as you saw with Devon the Chain, is explosiveness, right? So um, that's really what translated well. I love that he went, ran a 4 3 I love that he came in at 210 because I was a little nervous. I'm not going to lie to you. Today. I was like, oh gosh, if I put this out here and he goes under 200, I'm going to look like an idiot out here. And then he came in at 210. I was, I'm excited for that. Like, because the biggest knock I did see about him was like, Hey, you know, what if he's not as big as he is, you know, in terms of that size and can he keep that speed and what does that strength look like? So I do think that, and the one thing too, when I was breaking him down, and I was kind of going through kind of his, you know, it just just his tape and kind of going through all 22. You know, he has very, very good north-south one-speed cut, right? The one-speed cut ability kind of gets up the field quick. He identifies lanes fast, too. And all that stuff just rings in my head like, man, he would thrive in some, like, just that wide zone scheme. If a team drafts him in a wide zone scheme and something very horizontal and they can just get up the field, man, I'm all in on this kid. And I think yeah, that's what you got to look for. So like we mentioned with the running backs, like Marshawn Lloyd again, yeah, he's a top three guy and Trey Benson, these guys, you know, look at where they get drafted and like a guy like Janet Wright in a Miami system. Oh my gosh, that'd be awesome. They already had Devon a chance. So it's probably not going to be there, but if they can go somewhere, I had the Ravens pre uh, Derrick Henry and it hurt my feelings that Derrick Henry went there. Cause I was like, man, I would love him on the Ravens. Um, but I think, I just feel like one of these, you know, Jalen can find a, location a landing spot that just allows him to get 15 carries that's all he really needs because i think his explosiveness has him has that ability to kind of just break games where you're looking like oh my gosh this kid is you know he's 10 carries 100 yards and a touchdown today and i think he's actually a pretty good pass catcher he didn't have to do that much in tennessee but he has that ability he's a three down guy i mean he was on feldman's freak list too so he yes. people have known of him but just he didn't have that elite production that you'd want to see yeah, I love that you bring up Feldman's freaks, freaks list. I'm always bringing that up. Um, if yeah. anybody doesn't, doesn't follow that, it's Bruce Feldman during the summer drops a sort of the notable uh, athletic kind of freaks in college in college football. And there's been a lot of future NFL stars. Marvin Harrison Jr., I think he had top top two or three uh, this summer. So, you know, the, the guy does pretty well with that. When we talk about the running back spot, I think we've got maybe about seven guys now that that 
you know, put a handful of seven. Mm -hmm. Some people drop it down to five. Some people might increase it to eight or nine that we're kind of excited about in this class and that I think have opportunities to sneak into day two. When we look at these players, what are the landing spots? Maybe list one or two that you would be really excited to see a rookie land in that we could start say, okay, there's a pathway. And also I like the scheme. I like the fit. Well, I got to go Dallas, right? Like yeah, I got to talk okay, That's the, that's the best one. <laughs> like, I think, you know, I, as a Dallas guy and just looking at like, they're going to draft someone in the second, third round. I think I, I, I really, it's hard for me not to, I follow all the Dallas beat writers and all of that. Um, to me now, here's the, this is where you have to be very careful though, because I do think that if they draft someone that doesn't necessarily fit their scheme, like you mentioned, this dude's going to bump up into the end of the first round and you have to really determine, all right, is this Keyshawn Vaughn ish? Like, remember that from a few years ago where it's like, Oh, he went there. Hey, he's going to go in the back end of the first or, Oh, I like his talent. I love it. Right. So it's really, that really where it comes down to for scheme dependent there and Arizona to me too. I think Arizona's sneaky. I think if Arizona, I mean, James Connors there, you have those areas, Arizona sneaky later, like a day two guy or like late early day three, I could get on board with an Arizona landing spot. I love that you said Arizona. Arizona has been one that I've been ta talking about for a while because of the, the, the openness of the RB two position yeah. and the age of James Connor. And also the fact that James Conner had a thousand yards uh, rushing in that offense last year, plus the opportunity to play next to Kyler Murray. That's mm -hmm. a, I love that answer. I'm going to throw out, I think Cleveland's interesting. Mm -hmm. The Deonta Foreman signing, the fact that Jerome Ford, I think is a little bit more of a running back by committee type. Uh, it's just Nick Chubb. Can he come back? And when does he come back? I think that that, and with his age, I think that's a, that's an interesting pathway. Vegas, mm -hmm. I think is interesting based on the fact that it's Zamir White. And Alexander Madison, I'm bullish on Zamir White this year, but not bullish on Zamir White if Jalen Wright ends up there on, on day two. <laughs> um, and uh, th there's a couple of interesting uh, places. How about Los Angeles? Because this is one where this has been like a Blake Corum spot, which is, you know, it might not happen, but you could see Harbaugh taking Roman Wilson or Blake Corum if they're there to him at a, at a decent value. But with the presence of Gus Edwards, do you think that this is sort of a – whoa, this spot is not quite as good as some people would think? Or would you be really excited about a running back being drafted to Los Angeles still maybe in the same light as pre-Gus Edwards signing? I think, you know, if Gus was a little younger, I'd be like a little more, more nervous and not the injury history, right? Like if, if he was kind of like one of those things where um, like, man, I could see him really get utilized there. Harbaugh and Roman have a history of doing um, split backfields though. So like, and even Harbaugh at Michigan, he definitely did. I know Quorum ran this last year, but before that Quorum split work three years ago um, with Hassan Haskins and then Donovan Edwards and him split work last year. So I do think that I like the spot for me, like from a Quorum would be interesting, but I think him and Gus are kind of, I don't want to say they're the same, but they, they do have the same tendencies as a running back and stuff. To me, I want to see if, if they can go grab maybe a pass catching back or something like that. I'd probably be a little bit more interested there, especially with the lack of receiving weapons on that offense, because you could, you know, you'd have to formulate that he's probably gonna get some targets there and maybe in PPR, he'd have a little bit more value there. Um, I like the, I like the spot. I'm less excited with that Edwards there, but that more that could be like a more next year play, like what we thought with Kendra Miller and Taji Spears. And doesn't always work out, Charbonnet, like those type of guys. Um, but I do think that there's going to be volume there. And if there's volume there, if you're running back too, I'm all aboard because you know guys are going to get injured. Follow the volume, if, especially in that offense. You that would excite me more. And if I get those kind of guys in the second round, I'm all aboard on, in terms of value. We've had 10 straight years of a rookie finishing as, I believe, RB20 or better. So, you know, one of these guys is going to emerge in a year from now. We're going to say, why didn't I take that guy in my rookie draft? Uh, I think having second round picks, having those early third rounders this year is really going to pay off for you, especially mm -hmm. if you're running back needy. Uh, let's pivot over to wide receiver Xavier Worthy. This is another player that you're very bullish on. Uh, this is a guy that I'm seeing some ridiculous draft projections, Kev, where you're seeing like, Oh, Xavier Worthy goes like pick 40 something. I'm like, it's not going to happen. Xavier Worthy's a first round pick. I think he was a borderline first round pick before that combine. I think he's a lock first round pick right now. Uh, I think maybe that there's a little bit of um, people are kind of overrating uh, just him as a pure speed guy, where mm -hmm. you know, you hear the people with the ridiculous John Rosses, the Henry Ruggs type comps. 
this is not that. Xavier Worthy broke out very early at Texas, set freshman records at Texas. Through three years, he was very productive. I think that there are certain teams that are going to look at him as a Jalen Waddle type. Where do you see him fitting in um, for most NFL teams? Where do you see him end up being drafted draft capital wise? Kind of share your thoughts and enthusiasm about Xavier Worthy. Yeah, I mean, I love Xavier. And it was so funny, man. The combine makes me laugh so much. Remember when he came in at 165 and everybody on social media is like, oh my gosh, oh, yeah. you better run fast. Then yeah. he runs fast and everybody's like, oh, he ran too fast. I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, you can't just, you can't move the goalposts all the time for that. Like he ran a, you know, 4 2 one um, You hit the nail on the head though. When you talked about how he's not just a speed guy. No, he's not. I think the thing with Xavier Worthy that people keep missing is they think he's just going to be a deep threat and they think that he's just going to play on that. He can just be a slot guy because he's 5'11". He can play every position on the field. He's scheme versatile. I think he can play on the outside because he can win on the outside. I think he can kind of go inside if he needs to and he has the separation ability and all that, but he can do it all. And I think that's the thing that makes him a lot of fun in that wide receiver four to six range, right? Because these other guys around that range, like Lad McConkey, Troy Franklin, who I like, I like Troy Franklin, Brian Thomas in those ranges. I think that Xavier is the most versatile of them all. I think they he can be on the field in different ways and coaches can utilize him. So if that if that's the case and they're creative and coaches are getting more creative, I'm all aboard. I think that there's a dark horse team for Xavier too. I know that everybody's mocking an offensive lineman to these guys, but he could go to the 49ers. If Ayuk moves on and they don't want to pay him, imagine Xavier Worthy in the 49ers system and him being used by Kyle Shanahan. That would be ideal to me if Ayuk moves on and they decide they don't want to give him that extension. See, I think that that my what's going to happen in the NFL draft is if he slides, he's going to be a Dallas Cowboy. I think That's that it. I could see I could yeah. see Dallas is just if he's there. Texas Longhorn, immediate wide receiver two upgrade, that mm -hmm. sort of speed. Jerry Jones, I think, would be all about that. But I love that 49ers projection. And I think with this sort of speed, uh, that there's a team that maybe we're not projecting that's just going to trade up <laughs> and get into that top 20 and just take him and, and run with it. So I'm, I'm really excited about him as well. Let's pivot to tight end real quick. Real quick, this is a, this is a position that's giving people a, a little bit of difficulty in terms of the guys that how they're valuing them ranks all that sort of stuff how many tight ends do you think are selected by the end of day two? Oh, four, i think i think four i think i have four i, I brock i'll just i'll just pick brock that's an easy one uh i think ben sinnett from kansas state yes. has a shot i i really like him i think he's very versatile i think he offers a lot of things theo johnson from penn state i think has a chance because of how well he tested his ras score relative athletic score is almost a 10. and then i do think jatavian fits in there i'm not as bullish on jatavian sanders from texas as, as some others are um but i do think teams might they might like him i think he tested fine enough um i think he's a back in day two guy if he does get in there yeah, Sanders is funny because four six nine is not something that that like sinks any tight end. But we were thinking this could be like a four five eight guy. Yeah. So it was like a disappointing forty. I love uh, that you met brought up Sanat. That's that's my tight end three right now. I'll give you my top five tight ends right now are Brock Bowers, J T Sanders, Ben Sanat, Jaheim Bell, and then Theo Johnson. Mm -hmm. And I go back and forth on Johnson and Bell. Um, but today I'll go Bell at the four and Johnson mm -hmm. at the five. But that's sort of my top five how would you rank your top five kevin yeah i have brock and senate at one and two i have theo at three actually uh jatavian at four and then there's a there's a kid out of tcu i like jared wiley yeah. and i don't know what's gonna that's happen a jeff, with jared. that's a jeff that's a jeff bell guy too i remember he okay you know he was on on wiley but yeah wiley four low four six forty yeah at that size that's exciting share your thoughts on wiley yeah, you know, I just think, you know, you love his testing, right? 9.53 Raz. And that's really relative athletic score for those you don't know. No, really tight ends. That's what it matters the most for. Like when you're looking at this, this is why I remember Jalen Weidemeyer, he just disappeared after he got like a 2.2 or whatever it was. Um, he did terrible there. Wiley to me, you know, TCU, heavy pass offense. We know that um, really good hands. Like he has some of the best hands of this class and he has athleticism to go with that. So if he's versatile, like we talked about earlier in the show, able to be split out wide, not necessarily that just that inline guy. I think he, he's kind of the best of both worlds because he has the hands, he has the versatility, but he's also 6'6", 250. 
So he can be in line. So he's going to get on the field. So how much opportunity is he going to get? I think that's the key. If he can get out on the field and showcase some of those skills, I'm all aboard there. I don't think he has like a ton of yak. I don't know necessarily like, you know, separation with man, but I do think he can be that possession guy that scores touchdowns because of his hands and he can be that go-to guy. So that's why he kind of fit in at five for me. So it's going to be interesting to see where he kind of lands. No, I love it. It's definitely a, a, a position where, the tight ends exceeded expectation at the combine. We had a bunch of these really athletic testing numbers. And I, I'm glad you brought up like the RAS score and everything. We That's the one position where you really can't be unathletic. There's a, yeah. ter- a terribly small sample size of unathletic tight ends doing it in fantasy football where we can pick a few running backs like, you know, Kyron Williams last year, slower at the combine, still productive, certainly a number of wide receivers who, who did not run well and had big time production, Keenan Allen. Uh, let's talk about real quick the the top of the wide receiver uh, class. Mm-hmm. Rank Marvin Harrison Jr., Malik Neighbors, and Roma Dunze. And is it close or is it a, a tears between these guys? You know, I'm I'm more of the so that's how I have it. Harrison, Neighbors, and Dunze. I'm I'm just you know I'm a loser. I don't I'm not going hot take. I do for the you. same. Uh, I do the same thing, but I want all three. <laughs> Yeah, so that's how I look at it. As far as where I'm at with like Neighbors and Ndunze and how close they are, I think Neighbors is closer to Marvin Harrison Jr. in that tier than than Ndunze is. Um, I, I'm pretty solid with Ndunze being wide receiver three, which means he can be a fantasy, you know, wide receiver one at some point. I do think that he has value there. Neighbors is just different, and his athleticism and what he did last year, um, I absolutely love what he can do. I think he, again, he's versatile in terms of that. They're two different guys, Marvin Harrison Jr. and um, Neighbors. Like they're two different profiles. So um, the thing that I think sets apart Marvin Harrison Jr. that people need to realize is his his footwork. Like he is, he's so refined off the line, and like he got so much better as a freshman to a sophomore to a junior. That's what kind of makes Harrison to me a tier above because he's going to be able to just earn targets separation, um, high level body control. Some of those catches he made. And as a Michigan fan, watching him at Ohio state, I hated him. I hated it. But some of those catches he made on the sideline, the one, the, the toe drags, all of that to me, neighbors is very close to like that Jamar chase physicality, really top end guy, creative after the catch can do a lot of those things. Um, and he instantly screams to me, wide receiver one on a team. Adunze doesn't scream that to me. Adunze kind of like a very complimentary maybe wide receiver one. Um, I would love for him to go somewhere where he is like with another guy, like a DJ Moore type kind of guy. Um, obviously not that now that Keenan's there, but that kind of like idea. Whereas neighbors and Marvin, I think can just be wide receiver ones. New York Jets next to Garrett Wilson. That gets you excited yeah. about Adunze. Yeah, that would be good. I think anything where I think Odunze would really benefit from just having a lot of one on ones and not double covered because I think I think he could struggle with that kind of separation at that next level. So if if he's getting double covered or defense is keying on him, I think he's going to struggle at first. I think it's going to take him some time there where I think neighbors can fight through those doubles. He's been doubled all the time. Marvin Harrison Jr. too. The thing that people don't understand about Washington, that scheme that he played in Odunze was very, very wide receiver friendly. A lot of you know zone concepts. A lot of people running in cover two anyway now. But I think that with Jalen McMillan and Jalen Polk being there, they couldn't do that against the Dunes. A lot of one-on-ones, a lot of things going there. They were the three best wide receivers in college football last year on the same team. Like three best. I will I will shout that to the rooftops. That's why they made the championship game. That helped in Dunze where I know my neighbors was playing with Brian Thomas Jr. I get it, but I, that's kind of my separation between the two there. No, I love it. And the title of the show is Rookie Tears. So we've got to debut our, or not debut, but we're going to unveil our top 15s in the context of tiers. And before we start with that, when we talk about rookie tiers, would you agree that single QB leagues, the elite tier is the top four? Yeah. Yeah. Top four for me. And then in Superflex, would it be a top eight for you to get into that? top end tier or would you push maybe a Xavier worthy and make it a, make it a top nine? Cause most no, I do a eight. Eight, eight. Yep. I, I cut off at eight because I think, I think you have to, because that's how it's getting valued out there in most leagues. So I kind of go with that, that consensus value there. Um, However, I wouldn't mind getting to the nine range because I like Xavier. I like some of these other guys. If the quarterback pushes some guys down, if McCarthy gets top 10. So I think that from my perspective, I wouldn't mind nine sitting there, but I do think eight, there's a little bit of a tear break there just on value too. 
And do you think that it's it's beneficial to dynasty managers to try to make that move now before the NFL draft to trade into these tiers, even if they have to pay for it? Or do you think this is a, hey, let's sit back, let's not go too crazy because the NFL draft could change some, th- some things? I think that, you know, everything in context, especially this year. So when you're looking at what could happen to push those tiers anywhere – Really, it just comes down to J.J. McCarthy. So I think that's really where that tier gets pushed at all. Um, Or if Rome goes to like the Jets, maybe that pushes it a little bit. I, As far as context this year, if I can move up a little bit and get into that top seven or eight area, I would do that pre-NFL draft because if I I think that there's still value to be had. So if J.J. gets the top 10 capital – that just makes your pick more valuable anyway, because you're just sitting, you already paid for it, whatever you, you consistently, but what happens if Brock Bowers falls to one Oh eight and some guy needs a tight end. Now you have a lot of different, you can use that now and kind of move and kind of move around. Whereas if you're sitting at one Oh nine, one ten, and you waited and now Bowers is there, there's no way you're going to be able to get in the one Oh eight mark because someone's going to love the idea of Brock Bowers, especially in tight end premium. So for me, I'm moving pre NFL draft into that range because I do think that the combination of those those eight is only going to increase in value. I don't see a significant drop unless one of these guys goes to like a terrible landing spot, like one of the wide receivers is the only way I could see like a drop in value in that top eight. Other than that, I think you're playing with house money. I love it, and I think that there's a lot of people kind of argue over the timing of trades, the timing to get rookie picks, yeah. but at the end of the day. The most expensive rookie picks are always when you try to trade when somebody's OTC. When yeah. somebody's on the clock, they've basically got your feet to the fire and they're going to squeeze you for everything they can. So if you really want to get into these tiers now, I think that what looks like an overpay today is going to be a lot cheaper than during your rookie drafts and probably right after the NFL draft during the the, the wild week when guys like Trey Sermon all of a sudden <laughs> steam up. Uh, so let's go ahead and and do our rankings here. First off, before we do it, would you have a cutoff right now where you would take a blind 2025 first round pick? Would there be a pick in the first round, 112, 111, 110? Is there a pick that stands out for you where somebody says, Kev, you know, we'll give you a chance to re-roll this pick next year. If you want out, I'll give you my 2025 first. 109 for me. 110, 109, 109. Okay. probably 109, depending on how that kind of shaped up. I'm totally okay re-rolling because I do think at, if when you sit there, I love Xavier and I like Troy Franklin and those guys, but if there's a chance that pick could turn into Luther Burden or Ted McMillan or Evan Stewart next year, I'm totally, I'd rather go with that play. And plus, as I've always talked about, once you know those players that the value goes down a little bit, 25 first is going to increase in value now, and you could still move it, right? Like you could still kind of pivot and go to go to those guys. So I like accumulate as much draft capital as I can. And if I'm a contender sitting in that back range of the first, and I'm like, yeah, I don't necessarily think any of these guys can get me over the top this year or can re- help me repeat. But if I can flip this 25 first for a guy like Mike Evans or one of these veteran guys in the middle of the year, that's kind of my strategy when I look at those picks too. Yeah, I love that you said that because that 2025 first, the randomness of it, you know, it's it, you didn't really do anything to improve your roster, but when it comes down to it, it you're going to it's going to be easier for you to get that missing piece mid-season yeah. for those guys rather than like a, a Troy Franklin or a Lad McConkey or maybe a running back that you're waiting to get that opportunity. Uh, it's hard to kind of take that that blind re-roll but oftentimes that helps you in the long run uh let's go ahead you're you are the guest so why don't you you share the top of your rankings we're gonna we're gonna do top 15 here but if you want to sneak another guy in kevin it becomes a 16 (laughs) you know no no real rules here yeah no so i i went through it and i'll i'm gonna tell you guys where my tiers are so I have Caleb and Marvin as my top tier. So tier one, to me, Caleb and Marvin Harrison Jr., just based on where they're at in Dynasty uh, rankings right now, um, you know, Marvin, top six-ish. I'm not sure if you have your combined um, there, but, you know, he came in at six for me. I just redid him for Football Guys this week. Caleb, Dynasty eight, I feel like in that range, they're, they're top tier. I have Malik in his own tier. So I have Malik at three in his own tier, kind of by himself, kind of on an island. Um, and then I know this is like, in super flex it's blasphemous but then i have the quarterback so i have may daniels mccarthy because to me i'm trying to figure out 
where their landing spot is and how I'm going to move them within that tier. Now, if May goes to, you know, the commanders for sure, he might bump up into that second tier too, but I think they're very dependent on where they go. Um, I have Bowers as well, just kind of sitting there at the back end of that, of that group with those four, those three quarterbacks. Then I have a tier break, a Dunze by himself. Uh, then I have another tier. So that just shows you that I'm not very confident in Dunze's kind of ability to be that wide receiver one kind of way we mentioned. Um, but I do think he's above those other guys in that so, range. So just to stop, uh, so Kev has a Dunze at eight and he's got McCarthy at seven, just to show you the sort of value for getting into that tier. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and would you, when you say the, uh, the, the, the three quarterbacks in that tier, uh, you know, getting those guys, is there another quarterback that you anticipate gets into your first round after the NFL draft? I know it's difficult because we don't know the landing spot for a Knicks or a Penix. Uh, no, I don't think I would put either one of those guys in there. I think Nick's is Derek Carr light. Um, he could bounce around for a little bit and like you be, he's going to start at some point. So like, yeah, that's a good second round guy. Um, Michael Penix too. Like, I think those are all just second round guys. I don't see, even if they get first round cap, like back in first round, I would, it would take a lot for me to draft him in the back end of the first. So you've shared your top eight. I'm going to give you my top eight in okay. tiers. Caleb and Marvin Harrison Jr., I agree with you. That's the top tier. Can't miss Teflon, Dynasty Assets. Really no reason to even discuss them. Then I actually have Malik Neighbors and Jaden Daniels in a their, kind of their own little mini tier. And then my tier three uh, for players, I guess, five, six, seven, would be Brock Bowers, Rome Adunze, and Drake May. Mm-hmm. Kind of you can flip the order based on your team needs. But I put Bowers in there. I, I think he's just truly elite, truly special. Um, Adunze, I'm a little bit higher than you are on him. And then, of course, Drake May's Drake May. Fantastic value when you get him around the seven. And then I have J.J. McCarthy in his own little tier of, if I'm sitting at the eight spot and he's there, I have to take him because, you know, the the the, the scarcity of the position and the chances of him to be a successful NFL quarterback one of the reasons I push him down is, like you said, it might be a waiting game. The other three quarterbacks, I think they start game one. McCarthy, I might have to wait on a little bit. I've got to balance that out with my dynasty rosters. But I think we're both on the same page with the top eight. Why don't you share your next tier of guys, Kev? Yeah, so then I have Xavier Worthy, Thomas, and Franklin. Those are the next three wide receivers I have in that range. Um, and then I have Trey Benson sitting there at the back end of the first. So I do think that Trey has a chance to get the best capital ab- among the running backs in that range. And I really think the Cowboys want, want Trey Benson. So like that's part of my thinking is if he goes to the Cowboys, I think he's going to have that back in. Um, and then that kind of wraps up in terms of the first round. Then I have a tier and I put Lad McConkey in there. A.D. Mitchell, he takes a lot of plays off, but he's got talent. So like that's the true like, you know, you see what's on film and the things he does well. And then Jalen Wright. So I put another running back in there. I put Jalen there um, at that back end of the second. I do think some running backs are going to get propped up in that range. I'm not comfortable enough saying who they're going to be, um, but that's who I would put kind of in that range right now. Yeah, and for me, I have uh, for my 9, 10, and 11, Worthy, Brian Thomas, and then Trey Benson. I, I sort of hit, okay. put him already there, so we're, we're pretty close there. Troy Franklin, I had uh, a little bit higher, you know, about a, you know before the combine. I pushed him down a little bit, not because I I I don't like him, but because there's all these other wide receivers that really helped themselves that were already pretty close. So worthy Thomas Benson, that little mini tier nine, ten, eleven, and then my next tier, I, I can't I can't trim it down now. There's yeah. a number of guys where I think it's pretty close, and I think there is a little bit of an argument that if I'm at the 112. 112 for me is a re-roll. If somebody wants to give me their 2025 first, I'm taking it. And Kev, if somebody wants to offer me, you know, the 204 and then something else on top, where I think I can win doing that, because I like Lad McConkey, I like AD Mitchell, I like Keon Coleman, I like Jalen Wright, and then I also throw Franklin, Blake Corum, and Marshawn Lloyd in that mix where I think Mm -hmm. after the NFL draft, all of those guys could sort of go there. If I had to truly rank them, I think AD Mitchell Coleman and lad would be kind of ahead because of, I, you know, the fact that the running backs, we have a little more question marks about and all those guys tested really well versus Franklin, but I'm going to go ahead and say lad AD Mitchell 
Coleman, Jalen Wright, Blake Corum, Marshawn Lloyd, and Trey Franklin sort of all in a big tier uh, for mm-hmm. me. So I, 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 I snuck a little bit in there. But uh, Kev, this was so much fun. Uh, I love podcasting with you. I hope we can do it again at some point. Um, but tell everybody where they can find your work uh, and what you have coming up once again in the month of April. Yeah, you could uh, find most of my written work and my dynasty podcast over at footballguys.com. Uh, I um, have some pieces coming out. Uh, at my day job, I'm an assistant principal. So I don't have a ton of time right now. But using the summer, I, I, I get a bunch of spotlights out. I get a bunch of articles out for football guys then. Um, and then we do do some stuff for the Debbie Row. If you're into college fantasy, those type of things, um, we have a Patreon where I do um, combined Debbie dynasty rankings. We have a YouTube channel that I have not been able to post to for a while. Uh, but Christian's been doing doing a good job of doing some Debbie and some draft breakdowns uh, at the Debbie Real YouTube. And share your Twitter handle as well, Kev. Yeah, at the boys underscore 22. Uh, it's a little Cowboys homage, uh, but to my family. But yeah, at the boys underscore 22. And they are ruining my life right now in the offseason. Cowboys always, always count on them to ruin my life. You got a Michigan National Championship. I think you're 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 doing all right on that. I'm end. okay. Yeah, yeah, you'll you'll be okay for a little while. Um, <laughs> but this was awesome. Definitely highly recommend uh, check out Kevin's work. Check out my previous episode of Dynasty Life, uh, where, where with Dan Williamson and also with Ian Miller, where we broke down the tight end position and the quarterback position. I'm going to be bringing a few more of these Dynasty rankings shows. Look for those in April, and we're going to get you going. More and more guests like Kevin uh, that are going to help you get ready and dominate your rookie drafts. We'll see you soon. Hey, I want to thank you for being part of this broadcast. If you have any thoughts on it, leave a comment. If you enjoyed it, make sure you leave a like. And if you want to see more shows on the Player Profiler channel, subscribe to it. That's how we know you want more.